Also, welcome those who uh, who will be watching this on LiveGate Outreach TV. After now, I want to believe God that the blessing on the house will be upon you as well, Amen. in the mighty name of Jesus. Uh, by the way, if you are here and you are not yet subscribed to our channel on YouTube, please make sure you do that. It's called LiveGate Outreach TV. All our messages are there, and um, you will be blessed, even as you go over them again and again and again, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is a good God. Since the beginning of September, the Lord has been leading us through a series uh, in our covenant season of purposeful living. Our church has a mandate. This ministry has a mandate to raise with God the people of purity. So I say purity, purity. Power, power, purpose, purpose. and prosperity. And this is what we preach. This is what we teach. Every one of those vision mandates or vision objectives have in themselves a, a, uh, an objective to cause your life to be impacted in a unique and a specific way. And so ever since the year started, we have been looking at the themes. And um, this season, this couple of months, September and October, we are in the season of purpose, which has been tagged Purposeful Living for this year. And I want us to really uh, take time to go over these messages, reflect on them, see what God wants to do in our lives. I have found that the secret to making progress in this kingdom is being obedient to God. Just listening to God, knowing what he wants you to do, doing it, and then you see the results. It's so simple, so simple. But you see, because of our natural senses and the way we are wired up and the way we reason naturally, Many times we find it difficult to agree very easily with the simplicity of the gospel. But I pray that God will continue to help us to be an obedient people in the mighty name of Jesus. So on this very day, we are looking at the theme, Purposeful Stewardship. Purposeful Stewardship. And we have a banner today which shows uh, the picture, a depiction as actually of uh, the great servant of God called Isaac. And um, Isaac, the biblical Isaac, is the son to uh, the patriarch Abraham. And if you notice very well, since we started this series, we have been focusing on a particular biblical character. Some of you would have picked it up, some of you might not have. And so I want to try and test you now. I want to quiz you. When we started with purposeful abilities, who did we look at? David. Okay. The next week, we went on to purposeful prayer. Who did we look at? Elijah. <laughs> okay, I told you I was going to quiz you. <laughs> okay. The third week, we went on to purposeful zeal. Who did we look at? Apostle Paul. Very good. And then the fourth week, we went on to purposeful leadership. Who did we look at? Hey, Peter. I had about four different names. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, Peter, hallelujah. And last week was purposeful obedience, and we went on to look at the life of who? Abraham. Abraham. So if you are following very well, we have now gone into the patriarchs. Last week we looked at Abraham, this week we'll look at Isaac by the grace of God. For our theme next week, which you will soon get to know, we'll be looking at the life of Jacob. And then you will see how the Bible is so complete in itself. Hallelujah. And I want to just say that the life of Isaac specifically, now each of these names we have mentioned, you can look at their lives from different angles and be blessed. There's no doubt about that. I mean, what do you want to say about David? We just talked about his abilities alone. If you want to talk about worship, you can just study the life of David in worship and, and have a, a whole year series on that. I tell you, very easily, because there's so much to learn from them. So, but we have taken time to just take, in, take, out, sorry, to take out aspects of their lives that is meant to just help us to focus on the theme of the season. So in terms of Isaac's life, we want to look at Isaac as a purposeful steward. First, we need to understand that stewardship, 
when we talk about biblical stewardship, um, while we keep looking at the picture, it defines basically man's relationship with God. We need to understand that in everything, God is the owner of all. Somebody say, God owns everything. This is a very key fact that if we don't have in our lives, we may struggle to understand our relationship with God. God owns everything, everything, including the breath in us. The Bible says when God created man, the first man in Genesis chapter 1 stood like a statue before God after he was formed from the dust of the earth. He never became a living soul until God put in that man his own breath. The Bible says, and God breathed into man, and then man became a living soul. And ever since that day, every time you breathe in, somebody say, come on, breathe in now. Now breathe out. Inhale. Exhale. What you are doing is living on borrowed breath. God-given breath. You and I have nothing. That air you breathe in and out now belongs to God. God put it there. That is why you find that the day God takes it away from man, that man becomes dust again. That's why we put them back to the dust. So when we understand that everything that we see, Psalm 24 verse 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. First Chronicles 29, David was praying. These are just scriptures I want you to note down. You can re review them later. David was praying and he said, he said, Lord, from you belongs everything. Everything we give back to you has come from you in the first instance. So God is the owner of everything, but we are managers. God has called you and I to manage the things. The breath he put inside you, he's called you to manage it. How do you manage it? First thing that you do with it is to praise the Lord. Psalm 150. The Bible says, let everything that has breath, what? Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. So because you and I have breath, we must use it to praise God. That's the first thing. Then we use it to live life so that we can do other aspects of ministry work. And may the Lord continue to help us to gain understanding. In the name of Jesus. Say, God owns it all. And I manage part of it. So stewardship defines our purpose in this world. As God himself has assigned it to us. Some of us have been assigned unique assignments in life. It's not everyone in life that will be a preacher. It's not everyone in life that will be a prime minister. It's not everyone in life that will be a doctor or a lawyer or a, a teacher or an engineer. It's not everyone in life that will be involved in mass communication in the media. It's not everyone in life that will be a sportsman or excel to the world stage in the sports uh, industry. It's not everyone. These are different ways God has put things which are his that he is given in the dynamism of human race into different people. The Bible says the Spirit of God gives the graces and the gifts of God severally to everyone as he wills. So stewardship enables us to understand what is our purpose in this world as assigned to us by God himself. It is our divinely given opportunity to work with God. There is a worldwide agenda that God has. The Bible makes us to understand that God is not wishing that any man should perish, but that everyone should come to the saving knowledge of his grace. The Bible says the grace of God for salvation has appeared to all men. And so he's not wishing that anyone should perish. But what he does is that he gives us different gifts that will help us to engage with that eternal redemptive movement. So stewardship defines our practical obedience in manifesting and operating these different things that have been entrusted to us. It means our consecration and possessions to God's service. Every time we talk about biblical stewardship, we must always see four things. Somebody say four things. Say God owns everything. Say I am responsible for some things. I am also accountable for those things. And God rewards me. So there must be ownership. Say ownership. Responsibility. Accountability. And rewards. This is the full life cycle of 
stewardship. When we understand that, if I as a person understand that the privilege I have, for example, at this point in time to be doing what I am doing right now, is a God-given grace and it belongs, that gift belongs to God and that ability belongs to God, then I start very well to be a steward that will understand how to be responsible with it. And the responsibility with it means I hear God, I ask God to use me as he has desired to use, and then I am accountable to him at the end of the day to report back to him to say, this particular gift you have given me, this is how I've used it. This is why we must understand that we must be responsible for the things God put in our lives. We must be accountable for them. And at the end of this race, there will be rewards. I say there will be rewards. The Bible says God is the rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Hallelujah. And so this is why I want us to see uh, stewardship in this perspective. Isaac was a man who knew this very well. And this is why we're going to study his life a little bit today. I like what C.S. Lewis said in his book, Mere Christianity. He said, every faculty you have, your power of thinking or of moving your limbs from moment to moment is given you by God. If you devoted every moment of your whole life exclusively to his service, you could not give him anything that was not in a sense his own already. Everything is given by God. So even if we give everything back to him that we have in us, we have not given him anything that he did not have originally. I don't know if it makes sense to you. You have not given God anything that he did not have originally. It's like you have a son and you gave your son some pocket money. Or you gave him some money for Christmas. And uh, he took out of that money, you gave him 50 pounds or something. And he took uh, 10 pounds uh, to buy something. A, I don't know, a mouse pad. Like my daughter gave me one Christmas about three years ago. And I always remember every time I'm using it, this came from my daughter. And uh, a mouse pad cost maybe five pounds or something. And she brings it back to you. Now that money has come from you originally. But you see, the gift that you gave back to God becomes a memorial. Every day I put my mouse on that mouse pad, I remember my little girl. Because she bought it for me, even though it was the money I gave her originally. This is exactly how stewardship is. When you use the gifts that God has given you, you set up a memorial before him. He put it there, but you must be accountable. You must be responsible and accountable so that he can be rewarding you accordingly. Rewards are in levels. God will reward you as you sow in this life, and God will reward you even in the life after. Jesus said there is a reward that is now, and there is a reward that is in the life hereafter. Hallelujah. Both rewards are things that we need for life to be meaningful. I pray that the Lord will continue to reward you. I say the Lord will continue to reward you in the name of Jesus. As we will soon see in the life of Isaac, Everything we have studied so far about purposeful abilities, about prayer, about zeal, leadership, everything we have studied about obedience, like we did last week, are things that manifested even in his own life as he was a purposeful steward. And I'll be showing us as we read that same scripture we read in the uh, opening for the Bible reading today. So Isaac was a man who exemplified purposeful stewardship in his lifetime, and it is good for us to... Uh, look at his story. We have taken our text from Genesis 26, from verse 1 to 33, which we read originally at the Bible reading time. But I want us to quickly look at some things. The first six verses tell us how God demonstrated ownership. Remember the four things I said about stewardship? It is all about what? Ownership, ownership yes. Responsibility, responsibility accountability, accountability, and reward. So God demonstrated ownership. The first six verses, we see how God showed how he owns everything and how he gives things to people. And I want you to follow very carefully. Verse 1. Let's read it together. There was a famine in the land. I can't hear you reading. Let's take it again. There was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech king of the Philistines in Gerar, verse 2. 
Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Verse 3. Where is that land? Look at it in verse 3. Let's read it together. Dwell in this land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands and I will perform the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. Now, how many of you remember last week when I was talking about how Abraham's promise became an oath? Can you remember? Some of you have forgotten. How did it happen? The, me, the moment he went to sacrifice his son. In Genesis chapter 12, just as a recapitulation, Genesis chapter 12, we were told that God called Abraham out of his people and he gave him a promise. He said, as you go, I will bless you. I will take you to a land that I will show you and so on and so forth, right? Now, in Genesis, we, nothing happened other than the fact that Je Abraham continued to move in obedience. But in Genesis chapter 22, God now put a very, very unique demand on Abraham. A son of promise that has been waited for for so many years. God suddenly said, offer him up to me. And Abraham took the boy and went onto the altar and was about to sacrifice the boy. And God said, withhold your hand. Say, now I know. <laughs> that you fear me. And then everything I have promised you will now come to pass. At that point, that promise migrated to an oath. It now became something that had to be done. When it was a promise, it was conditional. It was conditional on Abraham fulfilling everything God asked him to do. But it now became an oath. Now, the oath was fulfilled in the days of Abraham, Abraham became mighty, he had sons and so on, but it was to carry on. And then a time came in the life of the son of purpose, Isaac, that God now said, dwell in this land and I will be with you and do what bless you. For to you and your descendants, I give all these lands. It is somebody that has something that has a right to give it. Remember what I said about Psalm 24 verse 1? He said, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So God said, I give you among the things I have and I will perform the oath which I saw to your father Abraham. Now, don't forget in verse 1, they said, the Bible says that there was famine in the land. Egypt was sorted. Egypt had the resources to feed people. It was very tempting for Abraham to have just moved on to Egypt. God said, don't go down to Egypt. There is a blessing I want to bless you now. And this is what I want you to understand about stewardship. Stewardship has to do exceedingly with obedience. When we, we always have a phrase that we say your allocation will reach you when you are in your divine location. There is a way God plants you in a place, puts you in a place, in an office, in a job, in a church, in a family. That when you are in that place... God commands certain blessings to you regardless of what is happening there. There was a famine in that land. It did not look like the natural alternative for people to go. But God said there to him, read verse 3 with me again. Dwell in this land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. Let's go to verse 4. He said, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. These are all a repetition of the oath made with his father Abraham. Verse 5. Let's read verse 5 very quickly. Verse 5. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Verse 6. So... Isaac dwelt in Gerar. If you were the one, wouldn't you dwell there as well? If God says to you, my son, stay here now. I will, and you are hearing him as you are hearing my voice now. I beg, wouldn't you dwell there? <laughs> you will dwell there. The Bible says, so Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Because that was the place of the manifestation of the oath. I'm saying this, I'm making this emphasis because stewardship is so important. Certain places that you are per time, 
may not look like the vision that you have. Somebody say division. Everybody, most people have a vision of grandeur. A vision of something great, something majestic, something good. You had it as a child. You saw yourself as an excellent footballer. You saw yourself as an excellent psychiatric doctor. You saw yourself as, as some kind of spirit special person doing ministry work in places that people have never been. You saw yourself in front of large crowds. Everybody usually has those childhood dreams at some point. Now, but as we grow, now a lot of it has come from God. But what we need to understand is that as we grow, we need to be hearing God to understand specifically face by face how we actually walk into it. If Isaac was in a place where there was famine. Naturally, he wouldn't want to remain there. God had to come to him and said, part of the plan is that you stay in this famine because I want to bless you. Hallelujah. When Joseph was shown the dream that he would be a ruler, to put it mildly or short uh, in brief, Joseph went through phases of life that did not look like it many times. But he knew that God was with him all the way. And so he was being faithful a steward. When he was in Potiphar's house, he was the best worker. They made him the chief steward. When he cleaned the floor, he cleaned it in such a way that when you looked at it, you saw your own reflection. He was perfect at what he did. When he cooked, everybody wanted to eat his food. He was giving his best to everything, and so they made him the chief steward. As fate would have it and as God will ordain it, he was put in prison for something he did not do, but even right there in prison, he continued to be a purposeful steward. He continued to engage with everybody, letting people's spirit be lifted, giving people the interpretation of their dreams, encouraging them to live wholesome, to live fulfilled, despite the fact that they were all in prison. And ultimately, God worked it out for that same prison experience to take him to the throne. I want you to know that every stage of your life today, you may be in a walk, in an environment, in the business, that not, not, it does not look like it at all. Everything that you are in right now may not look like where God is taking you, but I want you to just keep hearing God. Because there is a thing about God in that place that will take you to your own land of promise. I say God will take you to your land of promise. In the mighty name of Jesus. That place you are working, you may look like an insignificant person there. God is holding you accountable for every grace he has given to you. Everything that is assigned to you there calls for responsibility and ultimately accountability. As you keep working, God will reward you. I say as you keep working, God will reward you in the name of Jesus. So Isaac dwelt in Jera. Somebody say purposeful obedience. He was obedient purposefully because God spoke to him. So in all this, we see how God demonstrated ownership. Then the second part is from verse 12. We'll just go straight to verse 12 and see how Isaac lived responsibly and was accountable and then his reward came. Verse 12. Let's read verse 12 together. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. Isaac sowed in that land, reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Don't forget, this was a land where there was farming. This was a land where most people will not want to farm. They will not want to sow because there was no rain. The natural circumstances did not look like what was good. But Isaac understood that he was in a land that God has put him. So he put his abilities. Somebody say purposeful abilities. He put his abilities to work. Isaac realized that I'm a farmer. I understand that when I sow, and particularly when I sow where God wants me to sow, there is bound to be a harvest. And so he went against all odds, and he sowed in that land. You must go against the tide many times. Refuse the situation that is prevailing in the economy. Refuse the situation that is prevailing in the news and in the media. Refuse everything that is negative in the atmosphere. Keep sowing the right seeds. Sow the seed of love. Sow the seed of your money. Sow the seed of your time. Sow the seed. That, listen, every one of those things, remember God has given to you. God is the one who gave you time. God is the one who made money come to you. God is the one who gave you the ability to be able to do the work that you do. Everything has come from him. So he wants you to sow 
And as you sow it again, you start to see him giving you the same reward. The Bible says in the same year, and the Lord, he reaped in the same year, and the Lord blessed him. The Lord will bless you. Amen. As you put your abilities to use as a faithful steward, my God will bless you Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. And the Bible says the man, verse 13, the man began to prosper. The man began, read it with me. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became. At times I like the English of the Bible. Just say the man prospered exceedingly. But you no, know, for emphasis. Somebody say the man began to prosper. He continued to prosper. Until he became very prosperous. What that means is that he was prospering. Regard the emphasis was against the tide. The famine was still in the land. But he began to prosper. Because he sowed. And as he was still farming and he was prospering, the farming in the land was still continuing. The negative situation was still continuing, but he continued to prosper. And despite all that, things were still looking very harsh. But then he became very prosperous. This is what happens to you when you are an ardent follower of God. Using your abilities regardless of what you see. Friends, to be a purposeful steward in this kingdom... And to be a person that prospers, you must be able to detach yourself from the natural. Natural circumstances are designed by the devil to work against you. They are designed by the devil to discourage you. They are wrecking marriages. They are wrecking lives. They are giving hopelessness to people. You must go in obedience to God, leaning on his word and taking the steps he's asked you to take, using the abilities he has given you, defying every odd and walking into your own prosperity. And my God will honor his word concerning your life in the mighty name of Jesus. How did he prosper? Verse 14. He said, for he had possessions of what? Flocks. Verse 14. He had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. Now, the next thing. So, the Philistines envied him. Of course, the Philistines will envy him. He was dwelling in their land. And as he was prospering in their land, many of them were still suffering. And so, they envied him. What this means to you and I is you must understand if you are a man on a mission, if you are a man in the direction of God and God is blessing you and God is helping you to have a testimony against every kind of odd situation in your workplace, in the place you are, people will envy you. It is not unusual. Don't sit down and say, why do people just envy me? They will envy you. Why would they not envy you? Your life is different. They will have to envy you. You are always smiling. You have never come one day. They've never seen you one day with heads down and looking like somebody who is dejected and finished. But every time they see you, you are bubbling. You are, you are looking prosperous and happy and excited. Even if you don't have money physically, they don't even know. Because you are always looking radiant. Your face is always shining. <laughs> so they will envy you. You and I must understand that this is why we need to be prepared when we are working with God. I like something Mike Murdoch said. He said, your adversary will always show up when you locate your assignment. When you locate the things that God has called you to do and you are taking steps to do it and you are prospering in it, your adversary will show up. The adversary comes in many ways. It comes in the form of discouragement. It comes in the form of betrayal. It comes in the form of uh, 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 ill treatment. People will treat you in a way that you never would have expected because of envy. Envy is a terrible spirit from the pit of hell. It takes people over. When people are envious, they can't control themselves. Some people will even say it to your face, that I hate you or I dislike you. That is the extent to which envy can push some people. Some people will say nothing, but they will scheme all sorts of things behind your back and just try to spoil your testimony and ridicule your faith. But you must understand that this comes with the terrain. As a purposeful steward, you must keep your focus and keep doing the things God has called you to do. Now, let's read verse 15. It said, Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. And they had filled them with what? 
with earth. Now, this is taking us to the core of the message today. Every time you see the word wells in this context, you need to see it in the spiritual perspective of the salvation mandate. Isaiah chapter 12 verse 3 tells us, now, let's read it together, it should be on the screen. Therefore, with joy shall you draw waters. Okay, it's not on the screen. Therefore, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. The stopping of the wells are symbolic of the attempts by the enemy to frustrate the true evangelization of the world. Every time, now listen, Abraham, Isaac was doing what God asked him to do. He was sowing in the land, he was prospering. We have established that. Why should Isaac now want to be opening up wells? God was already feeding his livestock because he couldn't have been prospering in the livestock if he needed the wells. But there was a need to extend the freely given, God-given life water to everybody around and all the livestock. And the devil was doing everything he could to try to stop the wells that his father Abraham had dug. So the Bible says, and Abraham and uh, um, Isaac began to dig those wells. Look at verse 16. When they were frustrated with him and they were envying him, they said to him, go away from us, for you are mightier than we. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. Now let's read verse 18. Verse 18. And Isaac dug again. Somebody say again. again. So this was an existing well dug by his father Abraham. Please follow me very carefully in this because we are going to trace this to Jesus Christ. Dug by his father Abraham, and the Bible says he dug it what again, and of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. Now let's read from there. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. Somebody say the ancient parts. Now what this means to us is that the devil is doing everything he can to close up the wells of salvation in our day and age. The wells of salvation is the message of the gospel, the true gospel that the world needs to embrace. The Bible says that it is with joy that people draw waters out of it. But the devil is doing everything he can to keep closing those wells. You and I must understand that as we are sowing in the land and we are prospering, as we are sowing and prospering, our businesses are doing well, we are doing well in our academic careers, we are doing well in our jobs, and we are doing well in the spheres of life. The whole essence is to keep looking for the wells to redig, the wells that need to be opened up again, the wells of salvation, the work of the ministry. Everywhere you are, everywhere I, I go, everywhere you go, we are lights of the world. We are the salt of the earth. There are wells there that have been closed up by the enemy that is making it difficult for people to access salvation. We must go and dig those wells again. Somebody say, dig the wells again. Look at your neighbor, say, dig the wells again. Locate them and dig them again. As a church, we must dig the wells again. It's sad to see what the body of Christ is turning to today. Now, I'm not in any way attempting to claim that this is the perfect, the only church or the perfect church. But we have a mandate. We have a mandate to walk in purity. Purity does not just mean that we will walk in a kind of sanctification that separates us and we, are, we call ourselves the pure people and we're walking about like that and we don't shake hands with people. Some people have defined purity to mean you don't shake hands. When you greet them... Especially if you are the opposite sex. They say, hello, bro. Hello, sis. Hello, sis. That is purity. Who told you that that is purity? Purity has to do with a lifestyle that is connected to the very life and the nature of God. A life that refuses to accept the norm of the day. The church is gradually being reduced. To, when I say the church, now I'm talking about the body of Christ. It's gradually being reduced to social clubs and the gathering of people who just want to socialize. In the name of the gospel, but doing no gospel. No standard at all. The same strife that exists in the world exists. Even professional associations and social clubs at times have better ethics than many churches today. 
There is complete impunity in leadership. Impunity in followership. Lady and clergy all just going their own way, doing what they like. We cannot afford to allow those kind of wells to be blocked up. We must open the wells of salvation. Restore the standard again. The Bible says, raise for me a standard in Zion. And as we continue to engage with God, we must understand that this is our job. We must not allow those things that have been killing churches and ruining churches to continue to be part of what we toy with and embrace. We must be a people of integrity. We must be a people of our words. People can no longer say what is on their mind because of a fear of one thing or the other. And then people say things that they don't mean. Or people don't say things that they mean to say. Where did all that come from? These are demonic spirits. You ask somebody, they say they have an issue, and then something, you say, what is the problem? They say, there's no issue at all, everything is fine. And then, so what's the problem? We must understand that we cannot continue to live like that. These are demonic spirits of the end time that is chugging up the wells, the wells of salvation that is meant to open up to people. You and I must fight it with every fiber in our being that we will not succumb to negativity. Our yes will be yes and our no will be no. In the name of Jesus. I don't want to stand here and say something and then you have to go home and be figuring out whether what I said means this or that. I think I'm giving you too much of work. What I want you to go home to do is to go and study the scriptures. Not to be thinking that pastor said A. Did he really mean B? Because five weeks ago when he said A, he actually meant B and C and D. No, when pastor says A, he means A. When he says B, he means B. And I want to believe God that when you say A to me, you mean A as well. This is the simplest way to live. These are demonic spirits. In the days of Isaac, they were blocking the wells, the wells of salvation. You and I must do everything we can to keep reopening those wells and not allow the devil to pollute our testimonies. And I believe that he will do it in our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus. I say God will do it in our lives. In the name of Jesus. This must be done by purposeful zeal. The Bible says, and he dig, they dug the, well, the, the wells again. And he called them the names which his father had called them before. Somebody say purposeful zeal. You can see we have looked at obedience when he dwelt in Jera. We have looked at abilities when he was sowing in the land with the God-given ability to know how to plant and to, to, to farm. And we have now looked at purposeful zeal whereby he was going about saying, no, these are my father's wells. These are the standards. I must redig them away again. And as you engage with God like this, you are becoming a purposeful steward of the manifold graces of God upon your life. So redigging the wells refer to zealous action of evangelization and defense of the faith. Many believers can no longer stand in the public places to give out tracts. Many believers can no longer stand in the public places to just give out a handbill, not even a tract, a handbill to invite people to a program. Many believers cannot do it anymore because of a shame of the gospel. And Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is what? The power of God unto salvation. I'm even going too far. These days, we all live in the, in the realm of the social media. We have a lot of things that we put out. A lot of believers cannot even just take their own phone, take a message, and share with another person. I'm not saying that go to them physically. Just take a message and say, I believe this will bless you. Listen to it. It will be good for you. And that is it. Maybe something was shared, they told you something that is bothering them in their life or in their marriage, and then you know that there was a message where God spoke through those things uh, about those matters, and you, all you need to do is to take a link in this day and age. Just take a link and send it to them and say, listen to this message. It will bless you. Hallelujah. This is how we redeem the wealth. When we come to church, we are serving in the vineyard by making sure that we are refusing whatever the devil will want to put our way to stop our own activity and our own energy in, and our own zeal in the things of God. Friends, I want you to know that God is counting on you and I to evangelize this world. God will not come down from heaven and be saving people from house to house. He is going to be using you is going to be using me. The reason why God gives us every privilege he gives to us is so that we can shine the light. Haven't you heard people 
tell you stories of their life at times and you feel like crying? I heard some ladies discussing on the, tel- on the, on the radio. On my, I was driving down to London in the week and uh, I was just listening to Radio 4 and uh, it just one of those things, stumbled into a program. Some women were discussing and how they were encouraging their teenage daughters to engage in open, free, you know, relation, sexual relationships with boys and were giving them the so-called counsel that would help them to still maintain their dignity. And I said, where did all this come from? Where did, the, where did the talk, where did the talk of no premarital sex go? Where did it go? Where did it suddenly become something that is no longer talked about? Now it is acceptable that people can just live like that. We have to redig the wells, friends. We can't just fold our hands. And I believe that one of the reasons God is bringing people, believers from all over the world, back to this country, this country that used to go out and evangelize the world, is now so far drifted back that we cannot afford to continue to live the way we live. We must understand God has brought us from the various continents and the countries of the world back to this nation for brief periods or longer periods in some cases so that the gospel, the wealth can be opened again. I said the wealth must be opened again. In the name of Jesus. Was it not this same country that John Wesley walked? Was it not this same country that people like Mary Slessor left and, uh, from Scotland and went down to countries like Nigeria and were delivering people who were killing twins because they did not understand? Was it not this same country? Is it not this same country that Smith Wigglesworth was walking the streets and, and performing great miracles and people were getting healed yeah. daily and saved? Yeah. Dead were rising in this same country. The same streets we walk. The same Wolfrona. A uh, shopping center there in Wolverhampton has the place, the very space where John Wesley preached when he came to Wolverhampton. We must understand. This is why I say to you, when we come and all we want to do is just to socialize and to fraternize with ourselves from coming from different countries and just to party and do that, that is not the mission of the church. And this is why, as a church, God is opening our eyes to understand that this is why we exist we do not exist to just socialize and fraternize. We can do all that, but it is a subset of the major assignment. There are too many wells that need to be reopened. I said there are too many wells that need to be reopened. And as purposeful stewards, using our different graces, our different callings, our different enablements, by the special grace of God coming together, we will become a mighty army in the hand of God that will be digging all these wells for Jesus in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, when he was redigging those wells, 4,000 years later, I told you I'll link it to Jesus, John chapter 4. He was redigging those wells, oh my goodness, we haven't got John chapter 4 here. Can I quickly have John 4, thank you so much. John 4 verse 11, thank you so much. John 4, 11. Now, 4,000 years later, the wells, the wells had been dug again. And what I want you to know is that um, before we come to this, after... Uh, um, um, Let's quickly go to verse 19. Go to verse 19. See what, what uh, happened. Verse 19 of where we were reading before. Genesis 26, 19. Genesis 26, 19, sorry. The Bible says, And Isaac's servants also dug in the valley and found a well of running water. Verse 19. Also, Isaac's servants... Last time I told you about purposeful leadership. And Isaac was digging. His servants were also digging. Isaac mentored his servants. When Jesus came, he said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Disciples are learners. They are people who follow what the master is doing. And the Bible says Isaac's servants also were digging in the valley and they found a well of running water there. Time will fail us to look from verse 20 to verse 23. The Bible says as they were digging, those people were pushing them away. They dug, dug the first place, they contended with them, they pushed them away, they called it Essek. As they moved from Essek, they went to another place, they contended with them, they called it Sitna. As they moved from Sitna, they went from there, and then they got to a place called Rehoboth. And that, the Bible says, they said, this is where God has brought us to enlarge. Hallelujah. Amen. Why am I saying this, friends? There are some oppositions you may be facing in your life now, or that we may even be facing as a church. It is pushing us from our Essek to our Sitna and ultimately to Rehoboth. I say it is pushing you to your Rehoboth. 
in Rehoboth, your enlargement will be undeniable. Your establishment will be undebatable. In the name of Jesus, everyone will see it and know by themselves that it is of a fact God has helped this person. In the mighty name of Jesus. Don't let all the schisms and all the strife and all the things, all the bootlicking and the things that people do in the workplace, don't get caught up in the rat race. Stay in defiant opposition under God and watch God promote you and take you to your own Rehoboth. In the name of Jesus, there is a place of joy when you occupy a position that even the people who employ you know that they could not have given to you. I don't know how to describe it. There is, there is a kind of a fulfillment that comes with it. It is, it is incomparable to anything. You know, when a man promotes you, they, they say, we give you this because of this. But when certain thing is happening in your life, and God is giving you certain testimonies that nobody can deny, and then you are now given the position, nobody tempers with you anyhow. They don't talk about you anyhow. So you and I must understand. Friends, there is so much that God wants to do in your life, but it will come in a place of battling. The Rehoboth is a place of enlargement. It's a place of fruitfulness. It is your own place of manifestation. You will reach there in the name of Jesus. So what did Jesus say? Let's now quickly go back to John chapter 4 verse 11. Jesus now had an encounter with the woman that we favorably, famously called the Samaritan woman because one of those wells. Now don't forget, Abraham passed the wells to his son Isaac. Isaac passed the wells to Jacob. So those wells were now called Jacob's wells. And they were handed over to generations after. Look at what the encounter was. You have read this story many times, but I want you to look at it from this perspective. John chapter 4, verse 11. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, because Jesus said, give me water. And the well is deep. Where then do you get, did you, where then do you get this living water? Verse 12, because Jesus said he will give her living water. Verse 12, are you greater than our father who? So Jacob is now the owner of the well. He said, our, let's read verse 12 together. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Then verse 13, very importantly, let's read it together. Jesus answered. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. Verse 14. But the water I, I shall give him will become to him a fountain of water springing up into what? Can you see how it is now linked to salvation? When Jesus came, God used that singular experience of meeting that woman at the same physical well. One of those wells that had been there and dug for the sake of giving water to people. As a symbol of the living water of salvation that people are meant to embrace after Jesus comes. I pray you understand these things I'm telling you. Hallelujah. When Jesus came, he said that now I am here. Remember what the woman is saying? He said, you cannot draw. This is the water. This is the well they give us to take water. Jesus said, look, I am now here. This is now about a living water. I have come. The water I will give to you, when you drink it, you will never thirst again. And it will become to you what? A fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. This is the purpose of the wells. It is about a salvation of a people who will have everlasting life, eternal life, abundant life. This is why Jesus came. This is why we must keep redigging the wells in the spirit so that many more people can have access to abundant life. I say many more people will have access to abundant life in the name of Jesus. Time will fail me to go into all this story. If you look at it very well, the woman was now the first evangelist to a group of people who were originally ignored, the Samaritans. And the whole of Samaria was evangelized by this one encounter with this one woman. So Isaac's servants also dug in the valley, and we talked about purposeful leadership. Verse 25, as I start to bring this to a close now, verse 25 of um, Genesis 26. We are going in and out of Genesis 26 a lot. Verse 24, verse 24, thank you. And the Lord appeared to him the same night, 
And this was after they've gone to Beersheba. He said, and I'm the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. Verse 25. This is very important. Let's read it together. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. Somebody say purposeful prayer. Say purposeful prayer. He called on the name of the Lord. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. We must understand that as a people who want to be purposefully serving God as stewards, we must be people of prayer. When I was praying very early this morning, I had a lovely time, lovely, lovely time, lying down on my, in my living room, just rolling down and thanking God for his faithfulness over God's people. I saw God delivering packages, and I'm saying this with every sincerity in my heart. God is my witness. I'm on his altar. I saw him delivering packages of reward to individuals in this place, just blessing them and blessing them and blessing them. And I know that God is about to do something, something very unique. I just want you to remain focused on him. Lose yourself in the things of God and watch God open the heavens for you indeed. I say God will open the heavens for you indeed. Whatever has been contesting your open heavens, my God will cause that thing to be destroyed today. In the name of Jesus, your own heavens will be opened to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, just stay in the place of prayer. The place of prayer is a place of battle. Remember when we looked at the life of Elijah? He prayed the first time. They said the rain is not falling. He said go again. He said go again. Go again. Seven times until he saw what he was demanding from God. You and I must not give up. When these prophecies come like this, you know that what you do is to engage in the place of prayer constantly. And may God continue to help you and I to press through in prayer. In the mighty name of Jesus. At the end of it, if you read it to the very end, like we read during the Bible reading, we can see that God truly rewarded Isaac. The final scripture I want to read is in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and verse 2. Those of you that can make it on Wednesday, please come around. We'll be sharing some more insights and praying some more on these matters. May the Lord bless you in Jesus' name. It's 7 p.m. on Wednesday. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 from verse 1. The Bible says, read it with me. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Tell your neighbor for me. It is required in stewards that you and I be found faithful. For faithfulness to be real. The Bible says that, moreover, it is required in stewards that one must be faithful. Faithfulness means that we are trustworthy. Trustworthy means that you are dependable. What you say is enough to be believed. Reliability means that you will not fail. When you say you will do something, you will do it. Loyalty means that you don't shift from here to there and here to there. Consistency means you've done it once, you do it again and again and again. Consistency is very difficult. Every one of those things are in degrees. Trustworthiness is at the base level. Every believer is expected to be trustworthy, and most people are. Reliability is also there, but it goes above trustworthiness because when they expect you to be there, you are there. Loyalty is very, very important. In our day and age, the devil doesn't want you to remain loyal to God alone. He wants you to be partially loyal to him and partially loyal to God. It doesn't work that way. What I mean by that is when you want to walk in the spirit, walk in the spirit completely. Don't depend on the, on the works of the flesh. And then consistency means you are doing it over and over again. I want to challenge every man in the house. Let your family know you as a consistent person at the prayer altar. I'm not having a go at you. People are at different levels. You may just be starting out, but you have to exercise yourself. Let your family know that when it is time to pray, it is time to pray. When it is time to share the word, it's time to share the word. When it's time to go to church, it's time to go to church. Be consistent. Some of us have learned consistency from our parents and we cannot move away from it again. When you are consistent, the people that follow you are also becoming consistent. And then steadfastness. 
Steadfastness is the most difficult. That is what makes you remain, regardless of what you see. It is something that comes with persistent obedience to God. Reliant on the Holy Spirit to help you to be consistent. Friends, God is looking for purposeful stewards all over the place. Not too many believers today are purposeful stewards. Many people have no accountability of their time, of their money. They do it anyhow. No regard for the things of God. Many people have no regard for the gifts and the abilities God has given to them. I want us in this place to understand that as we take the ownership from God, the, we, we, as we receive from God who is the owner, we are responsible people. I say we are responsible people. We will be accountable people. And we will be rewarded by the same God. In the name of Jesus. Jesus.